Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm not sure how many people are already watching and viewing, but um, if you miss anything, uh, this whole talk will be on YouTube afterwards, and I will obviously post a link uh, in the event, and um, you can always rewind back and catch up on anything you miss later. Um, so uh, real quick, um, if anyone has any questions while I'm talking, there's a Q&A uh, button right in the event page. Um, you can click that and put your questions there, and I will probably break every, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes just to see if anyone's got fresh questions to answer. Um, and if there's anything that's sort of, I don't know, advanced or complicated, I might just save it till the end because I want to try to get to the basics of Scrivener first, um, just the bare minimum of what you need to know, I think, uh, for NaNoWriMo. And then um, I'll do a few more advanced things toward the end. <clears throat> so um, a quick introduction. And I'm sorry, by the way, if I keep looking over here, that's where my main monitor is uh, and all my windows. So I will try not to do that too much. But most of the time, I'm going to be sharing my Scrivener screen, so it won't matter. Um, OK, so me, I am uh, Jason M. Huff. And I am a, um, I'm an author. I'm a science fiction author. I, my first three books all came out last year. Um, uh, before that, though, I did uh, NaNoWriMo twice. Uh, the first time was in 2007. And I succeeded, uh, but I had uh, no idea what I was doing. I had no plan going in. Uh, it was a real struggle. And the thing that I wrote was, was terrible. Um, but it was a really great learning experience, and even though the book wasn't any good, I, it's sort of what made me realize that I just really enjoyed uh, not just writing. I knew I liked writing, but writing in a, in a novel-length format and um, just all of the uh, creativity and energy and fun that goes into that. So um, I did NaNoWriMo again in 2008, but that time I had a detailed plan. I had an outline. I had all my ducks in a row, so to speak. And I did the 50,000 words, and then I kept going and um, ended up with a 125,000 word novel uh, about three months later. Uh, and that ended up um, coming out last summer as the Darwin Elevator, which went on to become a New York Times bestseller. So um, it can happen, and uh, I think it's awesome that you're all doing it. So what I wanted to do tonight was give you an introduction to Scrivener, which I've been using since 2008. and um, I've just been in love with it ever since. I think it's, uh, it, it matches the way that I think in terms of how to tackle a, a project of this size undertaking. I think that Word or something like Word is woefully um, inadequate for uh, uh, work of this magnitude. Uh, it's great for you know, letters and short documents, I think, but when you get past a couple hundred pages, um, it starts to get really difficult to navigate your book make changes to it, even just loading it in Word can take a long time on, a, on an even, even on a good machine. So, um, so you will see why in a minute why I think Scrivener uh, handles this type of project much better. And if you just do a few things um, from the beginning, uh, you can make it work even better for you. And, um, and so that's why I wanted to just give you this little primer tonight. So, uh, the thing is, uh, although Scrivener works for me and it works for a lot of people, a lot of people don't like it. They find it too complicated or just weird, um, and that's okay. Uh, it might not work for you, and you may decide in tonight's thing that it doesn't work for you, or you may try it in November and just give up. Uh, I think the important thing to me about NaNoWriMo, or one of the great things that you can take away from it, is learning a lot about what your process is and um, figuring out something that works for you. So there is no magic way to do it. There's no right or wrong. Um, but it's NaNoWriMo is a great time to just try stuff. So um, uh, also, I just wanted to say that I've never done this talk before. I've never tried to teach anyone Scrivener before. So if this is a total disaster, I apologize. Um, and again, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A uh, in case I miss stuff or go over something too quickly or whatever. I mean, like I said, I've been using it for like six years now. And uh, I'm really used to it, so I may um, just gloss over something that seems obvious to me but, but confuses you. So on that note, um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that I'm going to be using the Mac version of Scrivener. Uh, I haven't used the Windows version in a few years, um, so I don't know if there's parity there yet in terms of features. I think they're basically the same. I mean, they should be. 
Um, but I may get into some menus or something that if you're following along on the Windows version, you just don't see. Um, again, you can ask in the Q&A section, and I will get to it every, you know, like I said, every 10 minutes or so. Um, but if I don't happen to cover uh, or I lose you on the Windows one, just don't, don't freak out. Uh, just ask the question. And again, you can rewind back on YouTube later and look for uh, what you missed or whatever, and hopefully it'll be OK. Um, but as far as I know, they're, they're close enough that it should be fine. Uh, so on that note, what I'm going to do is um, hop over to Scrivener. And I'm going to start sharing my screen here. So let me just turn that on real quick. Screen sharing, here we go. OK, so if this is working, you should see my Mac desktop now. Um, if anybody is not seeing it, or you can't hear me, or something's not working, um, feel free to uh, hit the Q&A right now, and I will take a peek at it um, just to make sure um, that uh, I'm not doing something terribly wrong. Because I can't see any of your, there's no like chat or anything here. So I can't see live what you guys are talking about or whatever. So I apologize for that. Uh, OK, so here's my desktop. And I'm going to go ahead and um, in Scrivener now, I'm just going to go, this is what you're going to do when you start, um, well, maybe even before. I, I actually encourage you to start your NaNoWriMo project uh, tomorrow, today, whatever you want to do. Uh, not writing, because that's sort of against the spirit of NaNoWriMo, but um, just uh, get your project open, started. And if you're like me, or you want to try outlining instead of just uh, going by the seat of your pants, then this will be a great time to um, get your outline, hopefully you've got one already, um, but get your outline into NaNoWriMo, uh, and I'll show you how I do that. And that's the main uh, takeaway I want you to take from this, is how I make my outline be living inside my NaNoWriMo project. OK, sorry for that segue there. So file, new project. Um, this screen shows you all the various templates that um, Scrivener has. It can do a lot of things, like fiction, nonfiction, screenplays, poetry, there's a, all kinds of stuff in here. The one that you care about, most likely, is under fiction, and it's novel. Uh, there's two others here, novel with parts and short story. I wouldn't worry about these. Um, you can play with them, obviously, but for the purposes, again, I'm trying to focus on what you need to know to do NaNoWriMo next month. Um, novel is going to be your, your go-to. So go ahead and choose that. I'm going to click Choose here. And um, I'm just going to give it a name. And uh, it will open up. There we go. So this is a brand new, quote unquote, empty Scrivener project uh, for a novel. And what you're seeing here, I'm going to go through this really fast. Um, again, if you have questions, just go ahead and ask them. Uh, but the screen may look a little busy to you, and some of these things are probably pretty foreign. So especially if you're used to something like Word. So I want to just quickly cover it. Um, in the body of the window right here, all this stuff, I will highlight it so you can see what I mean. This is just a description of what this template does. And it's showing it to you because it's the first thing in this area over here. Hopefully you can see my mouse cursor. I don't think you can, actually. Um, but I'm talking about this binder over here. So whoops. Um, all these things over here are the binder. And that's where Scrivener organizes um, all of the content that is in your project. And it's important to note that I called it a project and not a document. Um, and we're going to get to that pretty much right now, actually. Um, so in Scrivener, you're not working on a single document like you would be in Word. You're working on a project, and that project can contain a lot of things. It can contain documents. It can contain pictures. It can contain links. It can contain videos. Uh, you name it, um, Scrivener can keep it in here and organize it for you. Um, if it's related to whatever you're writing, then you might want to keep it in here in order to just have everything organized and sort of contained in one spot. So later on, if you, um, you know, five years from now or something, if you decide to come back to this book and you want to work on it some more, um, if you had, you know, bookmarks in, in, in your browser or, you know, some images that were helping you or whatever, you know, it's, it's one thing to keep them all scattered around on your, in your browser or on Pinterest or something like that. Um, but you may not be able to find those things later because they're not all in one spot. So Scrivener would let you 
um, sort of keep and maintain all those things in one place. And I think that can be really powerful when you want to, um, like I said, edit something down the line. So, um, but there's a lot of stuff in here that you don't need to worry about at all, especially for November. So what I want to do is focus on the things you do need to use. And I will just quickly mention the ones that are sort of completely optional for you to look at at your leisure. Um, so the main thing in Scrivener that you need to care about is this manuscript folder. So the manuscript is the actual book and everything inside it is what will become your book whenever you want to output or what they call compile your, your actual document. So that's something that I will show you later on. Um, but uh, real quick, there's some other things in here. This, this characters thing is um, where you can put um, like character sketches or just, you know, quick, uh, you know, name, you can put an image, uh, things like that. It doesn't have any in here, but um, I'm not sure why they're empty. I thought it usually had an example. Similarly, there's a section for places. Um, the front matter is important because um, we don't really need to talk about it right now, but just real quick, this is where you would have things like your, um, your cover page, if you're gonna be sending this to an agent or something. Um, the title page was where you would have your name, your phone number, your agent's name if you have one, uh, project title, et cetera. Um, some of these things don't actually get set here, but we don't need to talk about that quite yet. It's probably overwhelming. Um, so just keep in mind, you don't need, you don't, again, this isn't like Word where everything's in one document. Stuff is kind of in certain places and they keep things isolated in Scrivener for a reason. Um, and we'll get to why that's powerful in a little bit here. Um, so just know that under Front Matter, there's a title page and that's where you can set some of the basics for your project. Um, there's also this paperback novel one, which if you're planning to print this yourself or you know, use a small press uh, or have somebody, you know, like um, I forget what Amazon calls their um, publishing service for print. But um, if you're planning to do everything yourself, this is where you would do things like a title page, copyright notice, uh, a dedication, et cetera. And then lastly is the ebook one. Um, and this is where you can put a cover image, which they have this default one here that you can replace. Um, if you're planning on, you know, doing your own ebook, uh, this is where you would put your cover and you can do a, a dedication here too. Again, not super important for starting November. This is the type of stuff you'd probably want to look at after November when you're thinking about actually doing something with the book you write. Um, so I'm just going to close up front matter for now. Um, lastly, there's a folder here called research. And this is where you can just throw stuff that is uh, maybe, um, excuse me, um, uh, research, obviously, uh, you know, like I was saying before, if there's images or Wikipedia pages or whatever, you can, or even just text, if you just want to drop some notes, outlines you've got, anything you want, you can just dump in this research folder, organize it inside subfolders like this sample output one, whatever you want to do, um, you can keep in research. And again, this is important because this research folder is separate from your manuscript folder. And so unlike in Word, where everything's in one document, you can have separate stuff here that um, doesn't have to pollute one another. So if you throw something in your research page, a research folder, you don't have to worry that it's going to maybe accidentally show up inside your actual book when you compile it to send to a, an agent or something. So, um, so that's what those are. So let's ignore everything except for manuscript uh, from here on out. Um, and uh, we will get to the manuscript now. So uh, actually, I'm really going to quickly just take a look at the Q&A and see if anyone's asked a question. Oh, and someone says there is a, a NaNoWriMo template that comes with the trial. So that's great. Okay, good. I don't know how that's different from the novel template, but there you go. Um, feel free to use that. Uh, so I'm hoping it's organized like this. If not, um, <laughs> someone let me know that I'm way off base or just go ahead and don't use the NaNoWriMo template for this chat, but use the standard novel uh, uh, template. Um, so the first thing that can be sort of weird about Scrivener is just knowing where to do your actual writing. Um, you've got this manuscript folder, and inside it by default are two things, a chapter and a scene. And on first blanch, uh, you might think that um, you're not writing a screenplay, you don't have scenes, so you're just gonna do everything at the chapter level, and that would, uh, you could do that, but it would I think it would be a mistake. So I wanna just quickly um, show you how this stuff works, and this can get a little confusing, especially if you're new to this or not, you know, super tech savvy or whatever. 
Um, so just try to follow along. And again, if you don't get it or have questions, feel free to ask them. Or just uh, on YouTube later, you can rewind this and, and watch it a few more times. So I've got manuscripts selected here. Um, what I want to do is um, turn those off for a second. So this is the chapter. And as you can see, it's empty. And there's a scene in it, which is also empty. The thing is, um, Scrivener has a, a feature that's counterintuitive at first, maybe, but it's actually really handy, which is that chapter, a folder, which is a chapter is a folder. Chapters can have text in, at the folder level as well as the text that's in the scenes inside them. And that's why it can get confusing. So um, I'm going to show you an example here. I'm just going to type in here, and excuse any typos I make, this is a chapter. And then I'm going to click on scene. This is a scene. OK. So now if I go back to the manuscript up here at the top, and then I'm going to click on the magic button in Scrivener. This is the thing that is, it's hard to wrap your head around, but once you learn how to use it, it's super powerful. It's called Edit Scrivenings. And it's, um, I wish my mouse cursor was showing. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it doesn't seem to be there on my, what Hangouts Live is showing me. So what I'm going to click on is this. I'm going to turn it off and on a few times just so you can see it. Um, it's this button right here, that little thing that has multiple documents kind of stacked up. That's called Edit Scrivenings. And what Edit Scrivenings does is it basically lets you edit whatever happens to be selected over in your binder. So you'll notice right now I have the manuscript selected. So I'm seeing both my chapter and my scene in one editing window. And before I said something that you may not have caught, that Scrivener is not treating all of this as one document like Word would. Each one of these things over here is a separate component. Um, you can almost think of each one of these as a separate Word file. And what Edit Scrivenings is doing is showing you all of them in one live editing window as if it was a seamless document. And so we'll get into a little bit later why that's powerful, but I just want you to try to comprehend the, the basic concept here. Um, and again, I'm just going to pop over and make sure there's uh, any questions, because sometimes people have trouble with this idea. Doesn't seem to be. OK, so that's good. Um, so what you're going to want to be doing during NaNoWriMo is edit, do, doing your actual typing at the scene level. Um, and you can, you can just click here, and you'll just see your scene for this chapter. And you can only have one per chapter, or you can have 100 of them. It's totally up to you. Um, what these mean in terms of actual, like when you produce your book, is that an individual scene is uh, it's just going to be text. I'm just going to type some BS in here. Um, and then if you wanted to have a break within your chapter, like typically you'll see it in a book where there'll be an empty line and then a pound sign and then more text down here to sort of indicate time passing or whatever or just a shift in point of view or something like that. You don't have to do it like this. In fact, you shouldn't do it like this when you're actually writing in Scrivener. What you want to do is, um, is when you want to go to another uh, skip time or whatever, go to another scene, you're going to click this little plus button that's up here, the green plus button. And that's going to add a new scene inside this chapter. And I'm going to name it poorly right now because we're going to talk about naming stuff in a second. Uh, so I want to have a good example. So now here's scene two, and I can start writing here. This is scene two. And again, if I come back up to the top at the manuscript level, you'll notice I've got my chapter, I've got my scene, I've got scene two. And if I were to add another chapter, which I'll do right now, and the way you do that, by the way, is you hold down your mouse button on that green plus sign until this menu pops up. And then you say new folder. So just keep in mind, a folder is a chapter. So again, I'm going to name things poorly. This is chapter two. You do not want to name your stuff like this. I will get to why in a second. But just for the moment, bear with me. Um, now again, here's the problem. I just made chapter two. And I could start typing here. This is chapter two. And you could have all your text here for chapter two. Um, but you're going to have some weird stuff result from this later when you compile. It's possible to get around it, and I will explain why. I'm tempted to do it now, but I think it's going to be too confusing. So all I want to say is make your chapters and then immediately put a scene inside them. I'm just going to click that plus sign again. 
And you didn't see it happen because it's um, it's got this little arrow here to unfold it, but I added a scene underneath it. And now I've got this is the scene in chapter two. And you're gonna see something interesting happen. Notice how it just renamed it over here automatically because I didn't change it from untitled. That's kind of handy, but mostly you're gonna wanna change these to something that's actually useful. Um, so just real quick, I'm gonna go back up to manuscript so you can see all of this. Um, here's my first chapter, that folder over there. Here's the scene, here's scene two. This is the text that I put inside chapter two, which is gonna disappear later when you compile it. So um, we'll talk about that in a little, a little bit later. Uh, and then this is the text that's within the scene, um, this one right here, underneath chapter two. So when you're writing during November, just make a chapter when you're ready to start one and then make a scene inside it. I'm gonna do it again just to, here's my chapter three. I'm going to make a chapter, then I'm going to make a scene inside it. I'm going to unfold it so you can actually see it happen. There we go. The scene. And then you can start writing. Uh, I spend most of my time when I'm doing a first draft, um, usually with the chapter clicked on, but doing my writing inside the scenes. And you see there's a little barrier that it's automatically putting in between uh, the scene and the chapter. This little line it's putting in is showing you the break between chapter three over here and the scene that's inside it. And again, I've got edit scrivenings turned on. That's this magic button up here, which I can't stress enough because it's going to confuse you if you turn it off or turn it on as to why you're seeing some things and why you're not. So if you ever have a problem where you're just not seeing something that you thought was there, make sure you didn't accidentally turn off edit scrivenings um, because that's the sort of the key to using Scrivener successfully is to understanding that concept. Um, okay, so let me just check my notes here and make sure I didn't skip over anything that I wanted to mention. Um, so let's talk about why you don't want to put text at your chapter level real quick. So I'm going to come back here to this. Remember, I've got these texts here. This is a chapter, and this is a chapter, and chapter. Imagine that that's like full-blown you know, prose, description, dialogue, etc instead of just saying this is a chapter or whatever. So uh, I'm gonna do something here really fast and I'll come back to it later, but I'm gonna compile this so you can see what it looks like as an actual uh, PDF. Um, so just hold on a sec. I'm gonna compile this and we should have a PDF, which I've gotta bring over from my other window. And it's gonna be too big, so let me resize that. Okay, let's see if this works. Whoa, okay. Okay, so this is the PDF file that I just made from Scrivener. You'll notice that that cover page that I mentioned earlier got added automatically. It automatically tabulated my word count. Um, you can have it put these things in for you automatically too. Um, we can talk about that near the end if you want. It's automatically doing page numbers. You'll notice even the font is different. This is important with Scrivener. It's you don't have to worry about your layout or your fonts or anything when you're actually writing. All of that you can tweak to your heart's desire at the end or whenever you want when you compile, which is what I just did. This is called compiling. This is what you want to do when you want to send your file to somebody else. Okay, so now we're here in um, the document. And this is the part that I wanted to talk about. You'll notice that it says chapter one automatically. I didn't type that anywhere. Then underneath it, it says chapter instead of saying, this is a chapter. And then the next text is, this is a scene. So it got the, this is a scene part and all this gobbledygook, but it completely skipped this text right here. This is a chapter. Didn't show up in my, in my compiled document. The text that did show up, you may have noticed, is the word chapter, which is actually coming from the binder over here. See how it's called chapter is the name? So the title of the chapter is coming in right here. I personally do not like this and I don't use it this way. Um, so over the course of this, the rest of this, I'm gonna show you how to change this so that it can work better for you. Um, but again, I'll just scroll down. So now it says chapter two and then there's a chapter two underneath it redundantly. Um, so the main thing to remember here is Scrivener's automatically gonna put in chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. You do not have to type that anywhere. It will do it for you. You can also tweak it to your heart's desire when you compile if you like. That's kind of an advanced thing. We don't need to talk about it now. 
Um, and then the text that you put in in the scenes is where the bulk of your actual prose should come in. Um, and that's why you want to write in your scenes. Um, and I will get into why that's important in a few minutes. So uh, I think I can close this now, and I will. Um, so what we want to do uh, is, um, here's what I want to change. So I'm going to go back to compile. And again, I'll talk about this more later. I just want to do it real quick so you can see what my little trick is here. And then I'm going to go to formatting. And what I'm going to do is at this level one option here, you'll notice this is level one, so that's folders, and then um, everything else is the text that would come underneath the folder. What it's telling you right here is that when you compile this, it's going to include, hey, my mouse cursor showed up. Cool. OK. Um, when you compile this, it's going to use the title for whatever's at level one rather than the text. Notice how text isn't checked over there. You can have them both checked. Um, but what I do is I turn off title because I use title a different way. And I'll show you that in a minute. And I'm going to turn on text. And now what I'm going to do is compile this again. And I'm really sorry if you can hear that. My, my wife is printing something out, and the printer just activated right next to my microphone. Hopefully it will shut up quickly. Anyway, back to this. Compiling. My PDF's going to pop up again. Let me grab it for you. Whoops. Actually, I think I did that. I think I told it to print. No, I didn't. Compile. Here we go. PDF, open PDF, and preview. That's what we want. OK, I just blamed my wife for printing something, but it totally was me. So disregard. Don't tell her I said that. Um, all right, so here is the new one. And I'm just going to scroll right down. And you'll notice now that we've got this as a chapter which again was the text we put in at the chapter level, finally showing up in our document. The font is wrong. We can fix that later. Not going to worry about it right now. That's a Scrivener thing. Um, but the point is, um, that's how you get the actual text that you have at the chapter level to show up in your compile, rather than the title. And that's important to me, because I use the titles um, as a living outline. And that is what I'm going to talk about now, because I think it's the um, my personal sort of innovation, I guess, with Scrivener, but it's the thing that I do that really helps me use Scrivener to its maximum potential and one of the reasons why I like it so much. So um, so let me just double check my notes. Um, so real quick, you may want to put some text at the chapter level. I'm just going to click on this again. Uh, a very common thing that you might want to put here uh, like in my first novels that I released, is say a date. So you remember when I compiled it, it said chapter one automatically. So you might want to have a subtitle underneath that that's the date that this um, chapter is taking place. So let's say we put January 3rd, 2031. It's going to be our subtitle for this chapter. And then I'm going to write my, uh, you know, it was a dark and stormy day. Um, that's going to be where my prose goes. That you notice I didn't even have to click on it. I just moved down below the bar, but that's actually going in the scene here. See that? So, um, and then here's scene two, which might be sometime later, because again, you break scenes when you want to have a scene break because time passed or the POV shifted or whatever you're trying to pull off in your book. It's completely up to you. You don't have to have multiple scenes. It's perfectly all right to have everything at one scene. Um, you basically just want to use it if you want to have uh, a break within a scene without actually starting a new chapter. And again, that's a stylistic thing. Do whatever you want. Um, I use a date in my, or I used a date in my first three novels. Um, George R. R. Martin would put like Arya here or something, whatever the character that this chapter is going to be, their point of view. Um, you might just have a general, um, I'm going to turn my printer off. Sorry, just give me one minute. Turning my printer off. Of course, now it doesn't want to. Uh, OK. It's shutting down now. Good. OK, so um, what I'm actually going to use, so the useless thing that I did here that you do not want to do 
is naming your chapters this way. I'm going to fold these up real quick so all we see is the chapters. Naming them like this, especially if you did this, this is everybody's sort of like um, intuitive way to do it, is to just call them what they are, chapter one, two, and three. The reason why you don't want to do this is because you want to keep yourself uh, flexible uh, later when you're revising when you might decide to move some chapters around or delete a chapter or whatever. Uh, you don't want to name the chapter with the chapter name. And also, just in general, you can imagine if you've got 100 chapters in your book, that this, with just the word chapter repeated here 100 times, is not very useful in terms of navigating your book. And you being able to navigate a 500-page book is uh, the thing that you want to be able to actually accomplish quickly instead of like you would in Word, where you're constantly hunting around, scrolling, trying to remember, oh, that was at about page 112 or something. Um, if you name your chapters well, then you never have to worry about that. And the trick that I do is that I name my chapters, I basically use my chapter names as my outline. Uh, and so uh, the example I'm going to use, um, which is my, um, pardon this for one second, I'm going to hide this from you because I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Um, the example I'm going to use is Star Wars because everybody's familiar with Star Wars, and uh, the reason I like to use it is because um, you're going to be familiar with your own book when you're done. And so if I show you something that you're already familiar with, like Star Wars, you'll sort of understand why it's cool to name your chapters like this. So instead of chapter one, I'm going to call it what happens at the beginning, or actually at the end of the first scene of Star Wars. So Vader captures Leia. Uh, and then I will name my second one, uh, Luke finds his message. Chapter three will be Luke, oops, Luke needs Ben. Um, so already you can see how if you had your whole book listed out this way as chapters, this becomes very easy for you to remember where something happened when you want to go back and check to make sure you, um, you know, you forgot what you uh, called somebody or you forgot what color hair they had or something and you're trying to run back to the chapter that they appeared in, um, this is just a quick visual reminder that will be always on your screen um, of what's where in your document. And, um, and so I highly recommend that you name your chapters this way at this title level. And because we changed that compile screen um, in formatting so that our chapter level includes text rather than title, this stuff will be hidden um, from um, any actual document that you output from Scrivener. So if you're going to send a friend uh, an ebook file to read to give you feedback or whatever, um, you don't have to worry about them seeing your outline inside the actual document because what's going to get included is not Vader captures Leia, but in this case, the word Arya, which of course now makes no sense. So we'll just say like above Tatooine. That's going to be our chapter subtitle. Um, and so again, picture having 100 chapters here, but all named like this. Um, you can quickly see how this serves as a visual outline uh, for your book. And it actually plays well into Scrivener's own built-in outlining tools, um, because that's what it shows you at that level. So let me quickly show you what those are. Um, and you can use these or not. You can actually just outline right here by making folders, uh, which are chapters, um, for all the beats in your story, excuse me, um, you can do it right here. But Scrivener has some tools for outlining, which are quite handy. This corkboard is one, and I apologize that it's stacking them all like this. Usually they're nice and spread out if you're on a nice high-res screen, but I had to make my screen kind of low-res here so that it would show up okay on YouTube. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so you'll see that it's uh, on these note cards, it's automatically showing us the title that we used. And you can also add some extra stuff um, about what happens in this scene. Detail goes here. Um, if you need more of a reminder or if you just like outlining at a more detailed level. Um, if you don't like outlining at all, that's fine. Uh, there's people who work that way and it's, I don't make any judgment. You can do it however you want. Um, but uh, if you're not going to outline, then you probably don't want to name your chapters as an outline. Um, what you could do, though, is uh, when you're going to write a new chapter, you're sitting down, it's November 12th, and you're ready to do chapter four, um, go ahead and hold down your plus, make a new folder, 
go ahead and leave it called chapter for the moment and add your um, your scene. I'm going to come back here and turn on edit scrivenings again and um, write this great scene. Ah. Create this great scene. When you've written it, then you may want to come back um, as just a housekeeping thing and rename your chapter at that point. Um, so you can remember what it was. And this one happens to be the great scene. Um, so uh, that's a way that you can sort of do this without sort of, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're adamant about avoiding outlining, because some people think it takes the spontaneity and the fun out of just going wherever their story takes them, that's fine. Um, but you may want to just come do it after you finish chapter as a housekeeping tool so that later on, again, when you're revising and you want to be able to jump around your book really quickly and go, oh, what scene was it where later uh, Vader captured Leia? Oh, yeah, it's that one because I named it that instead of it being chapter two um, because you'll just never find it again and you'll have to scroll around sort of randomly and hope you remember what part of the book it was in. So I'm going to pop over and look for any questions. And I don't see any, so that's good. That means everybody is following along. Um, OK, so going back to my notes, we talked about well-named chapters. Um, so uh, what I want to do now, I think, is um, I'm going to bring over a more robust project that I've already populated with stuff to give you guys um, just a better idea of what it looks like when you're further in. Um, so I'm going to pull this over here. And I'm going to go ahead and hide that one behind it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is my sort of demo project. Um, again, it's using Star Wars. And you'll see now that I've got every chapter in my binder. Um, and uh, they're all named reasonably well. There's a few of them I could probably do better on. Um, I will say, so if you're curious about my naming technique, here's the rule of thumb I use. First of all, I try to name my chapters in five words or less. And I usually try to do it in three. And the format is always noun, verb, noun. So Vader captures Leia. Uh, that's just the most concise way that you can describe what happens in, in that chapter. <clears throat> and I always try to do, if I can, the thing that happens at the end of the chapter. And the reason is, again, I set all these up before I start writing. So I have every chapter mapped out this way before I start a book. Um, and because it's how I outline. And um, having the thing that's described be the end of the chapter means that whenever I sit down to start a new chapter, I... Knowing where I'm starting is fine, but what I really want to know is what I'm trying to get to by the end of that chapter. Because I, I, when I outline and set all these chapters up, I'm doing that so I can try to get my, the pace of the book how I want it to be. And so having a goal that I'm working towards with each chapter, like I know that this, I don't have now this chapter is going to start, but what I want to get to is Vader capturing Leia. That's where I need to be at the end. Um, and so that's how I try to do it. If for some reason the end of a chapter is particularly like just not suited for this, which happens occasionally, then you could just do whatever the most major event that occurs as far as you're concerned anyway, um, or something like that. But rule of thumb for me is three words, noun, verb, noun, um, with uh, the end of the chapter being what I'm trying to describe. And uh, it, it just makes, when I sit down to write every day, especially when I'm starting a new chapter, it's just that much easier for me to go, okay, so that's where I'm going. And then I can sit back and think about what's a really cool way to open this chapter and then uh, have my, uh, my arc find me uh, get to that end. Um, <clears throat> and so again, what you can do is uh, when you have these set up and you've got scenes, you don't have to create See, I've, I've named some of these scenes inside. You don't have to get to this level of detail if you don't want to. You can just call them scenes. It's not as important to um, name the individual scenes like that. I did a few of them in here, but if I go back and look at any of my actual published books or the one I'm working on now, uh, for the most part, only the chapters get this attention in terms of how I name them. And I just kind of let the scenes, I, I just let it auto-name the scenes usually, unless it's something like really important. but. 
Um, uh, so let's see. So what I want to do is, um, if we again we talk about edit scrivening. So the cool thing is, I've got all this stuff over here, but if I come over here to my actual window where you're going to be writing in the center here, um, this is the entire Star Wars script. Uh, that's how a quick Scrivener can can display it. I can grab an individual scene right here. Um, I can grab this one, or I can go look at the whole thing, and it's almost instantaneous when it shows it to you. Um, I don't know what it is about Word, but trying to get it to show you a couple hundred pages of text, um, it just kind of chugs on it for a while, and then moving around it later is really tough. And again, the flexibility that you get by naming things this way is you if you decide later um, that you really want Vader to order the search of Tatooine before Luke finds Leia's message, then all you have to do is just drag this up here. And it will be, make sure you drag it at the right, drop it at the right spot. I think I got it. Yep. Um, and now when I output this book, um, and sort of ignore the fact that it's a screenplay, by the way, I just needed something to put in here to have example text. Um, but now I've just reordered chapters. It was that easy. Um, if I don't like that or my editor doesn't like that and says move it back, okay. All done. That's all you have to do. So, uh, and the same thing happens for scenes, by the way. And this is why I think it's really good to not write at the chapter level, but to write at the scene level, because you may decide that it's not a chapter you need to move, but you want this portion of this chapter. You think, you know what? That actually works better at the end of the previous chapter. So just drag it up there, and now that's where it is, and you're done. Uh, it's just as easy to move it back. So there's no like, Oh, I got to highlight all the text for that scene and then copy it and paste it, uh, and you know, risk pasting it in the wrong, pasting it in the wrong place, um, or you know, maybe losing like um, annotations that you might have because you copied and pasted. All that sort of stuff is you don't have to worry about. <coughs> Man, I'm gonna drink a water here real quick. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, again. Uh, the manuscript, which I've renamed here, A New Hope, um, that's where all of your text for your book should be. Uh, make chapter folders and then make scenes with inside them, and that's where you should do your writing. If you, if you mess up or you put something in the wrong place, don't panic. <clears throat> you can occasionally freak out a little bit with Scrivener because you thought you had, for example, if I clicked on this chapter right here, but I accidentally didn't have Edit Scrivenings turned on, then suddenly I would look like, I had deleted all of that. Um, all I've got is the is the text at the top level, and these three scenes below it just vanished. And I've I've seen people, you know, uh, they've told me or they've claimed elsewhere that Scrivener ate part of their book, or they just they just lost it or whatever. And I suspect that often it's just because they they had the text in a in a scene beneath something and forgot to turn edit scrivenings on, and so they weren't seeing. When you have edit scriptings on, it shows you what's selected and anything underneath it. So that's why when I'm at manuscript level, I see everything. And when I'm at Vader captures Leia, I see the three scenes that are contained within that and nothing more. So this is also useful um, because it only lets you have to look at what you need to be working on. And one of the things about NaNoWriMo, if you've never done it before, uh, in my mind, is eliminating any distraction that you can. And so, to that end, um, if I'm only if I'm Luke, working on the Luke meets Kenobi chapter, um, I can click on it only, and now I don't have to worry about seeing the rest of that stuff. I can just focus on this chapter and nothing else. Um, and that's also very useful, by the way, when you're working on a brand new chapter. Let me see if I can find one. It's empty. Oh, I actually put text in a lot of these. I think some of it's just duplicated. Here we go. Heroes flee to Han ship, totally empty. So if that's the chapter I'm writing today. Um, it's a blank page and I can just go with it. Uh, sometimes you might find a blank page daunting. So here's something kind of cool. The, the edit scrivenings window here in the middle shows you whatever's selected and below it, like I said. Well, you can multiple select. So if I hold down uh, control and select the chapter before this one, now I'm seeing both of those. And I can come down to the end here and here's my scene that goes inside um, Actually, it's not a scene. It's at the chapter level, so that's a problem. Uh, but we won't worry about that at the moment. Um, so now I can basically have my quote-unquote blank page for this chapter, Heroes Fleet of Han's Ship. But I'm seeing the text that was right before it, and that might be good for just reminding you where you were or whatever. Um, 
I most of the time, if I'm doing a first draft, I just work only on the chapter that I'm working on, and the rest of it I don't bother with. And then when I'm revising, I do a mix of all kinds of stuff. I might be at the very top here, or you may be doing things like, and here's another fancy one. This is pretty cool. Um, you could, if you wanted to, let's, let's say you decided you wanted to uh, work on Luke as a character. And so you just want to do Luke's chapters. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to control click on Luke's. And now I'm basically getting a version in the middle here of this book. Pretend it's not a screenplay, please. I'm getting a version of this book that is only Luke. And I can imagine, I know George R. R. Martin does not use the software, but I can imagine if he did, how awesome it would be to be able to just select all of um, Jon Snow's chapters and work on it as if it was a, a Jon Snow novella and just ignore everything else and make sure it's consistent and that his character's growing the way he wants him to and all that. To have to navigate around and try to find those chapters that are from Jon's perspective, or Luke's perspective in this case, um, could, could be cumbersome. Uh, and so I think this is really powerful that you can let the edit scrivenings, again, that's the magic button up there. Um, you can use that to just see a portion of your novel. Um, and that's really powerful. Here's just Vader's stuff. Um, I hope that makes sense. And, uh, you know, I'm getting a little bit ahead of where you need to be in terms of just doing Anarimo. You really don't need to worry about this until you're revising. In fact, if you guys want me to do another one of these after November and uh, show you how to, how, to, how to get into the revisions, um, I'm happy to do that too. Um, the main takeaway, again, is just to name your chapters with a way that visually reminds you of what happens in them so that you can really quickly go, ah, I, gotta, I gotta fix that scene where um, Kenobi is, where Vader and Kenobi fight. Where did that happen? Oh, it's right there. Kenobi defeated by Vader. If these all just said chapter, 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 I would have no idea where that is. Basically just go to my full manuscript and either try to search for it or scroll around and hope I just happen to spot that place. Uh, and that's no fun. So it may look like it's not that big of a deal because I've only got like 15 quote unquote chapters here. Um, but you know, I've written books that have uh, 50 chapters, uh, 80 chapters. Um, I just read a book, I just finished reading a book yesterday that had 110 chapters. Um, so, you know, when this gets really populated and you're well into your novel, um, and maybe you're writing epic fantasy or something and you've got a thousand page book you're trying to do, uh, being able to just keep it organized is, becomes really important. It may not seem like it at the beginning if you've never tried to do a novel before, but um, it will really help you in the long run. So that's my pitch, I guess, on on doing that. So um, uh, one other thing to show you for November, uh, and you can use this all the time with Scrivener, but it's particularly handy when you're doing NaNoWriMo, and that's your project goals. So I'm going to click on the project menu up here, and I'm going to go down to show project targets. And this might not pop up on the right place. Yep, it's on the screen, so just give me a second. I'll drag it over here. OK, so I think you can see that now. Um, uh, ignore the number of words this says I have because, again, this is a populated project. But hopefully, if you're doing nano fresh like you should be, um, uh, it would say zero words for your total here. So what you can do, and this is the really cool thing, um, for your a new hope target, that's maybe would say manuscript target for you, uh, it should say zero of zero words. You can set your goal here because it's nano remote, it's 50,000, 50,000 words. And you just saw that I got a progress bar there. So hopefully this is what it'll look like for you maybe uh, you know, three weeks in or something. Looks like I might have a question here. So I'm going to, um, yeah, somebody's saying to note the POV colors. I will talk about the POV thing in, right after this, actually. I was, that was the next thing I was going to get to. So uh, Mr. Holmes, J.R. Holmes, just hold on a minute. Um, I will get to that in a second. Uh, so again, NaNoWriMo, you set your, your project Goal of 50,000 words. How did I just make that disappear? Let me get that back. There it is. Um, and then uh, the session target is, um, is what I want to talk about, because that's the thing that's really going to help you stay on track for November. So I set my goal to 50,000. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on Options down here. And this is where you can do some really cool things. So what I'm going to say is that 
I have a deadline, and that deadline is going to be uh, what I'm going to do for the purposes of this call or this thing is say November 26th, um, 2014, uh, because I want to do it one month so you can get an idea of where this is going. You would put um, November 30th uh, for your for your NaNoWriMo. Uh, and then you want to say, um, uh, you want to count text written anywhere. You don't need to worry about that. You may want to allow negatives in case you decide to delete a chapter one day and make sure you don't get off target. Um, and then you're going to automatically calculate the deadline from the draft. Now, this is neat. You can say what days you're planning to write on. Uh, I try to write every day, except I take Sundays off. Um, you may only be, maybe you think you're only going to have time to do nano on the weekends. So you would just turn on um, Saturday and Sunday. For the purposes of right now, I'm going to turn on every day and just say I've decided to devote my evenings for the, the next month to writing this book. Uh, and then you want to turn on allow writing on the day of the deadline, which just means if it's November 30th, you can still be writing. Um, you can turn on notifications if you want. I'm not sure if the Windows version has that, but that just basically puts little pop-ups on your screen when you hit your target. I find pop-ups distracting, so I tend to turn all of them off. I think that might be on by default for you. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so now what's going to happen is, oh, and I should probably have done this on an empty project, but what you should be seeing is you have zero words out of 50,000. Your session target, because you haven't written anything yet, is probably zero of, I'm going to guess, like 1,600 and something for the day. And that's the pace you need to be on to do NaNoWriMo and get your 50,000 words, 1667, I think it is. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see the deadline and how many days you have left. So the cool thing about this is every day when you sit down to write, um, you don't have to have this on your screen all the time if you don't want to, but it can actually be kind of handy as a, it makes it almost like a video game where you're just trying to get this bar to fill up by writing as many words as you can, and you'll get a little ding when you hit your goal for that day, and you know you can take a break or maybe you want to keep going, whatever. And uh, conversely to that, if you decide to take a few days off, or maybe you don't, that's not a decision you can make, you just have other stuff going on in your life, which is totally normal, um, Scrivener will automatically tell you that your new goal is now 1,800 per session or 2,000, a session being a given day. That's what they mean by session target. Um, and so if you start to fall behind, you can visually know right away like what that actually means. And if you've never attempted uh, NaNoWriMo before or writing a novel, you may not have any sense yet of how many words per day you can comfortably write. Um, but I will tell you that 1,600 and whatever is actually a lot. Um, I, as a full, I'm a full-time writer now, and I, my average output is, these days is about 1,100 words. So NaNoWriMo is like a 50% uptick in performance for me um, if I want to meet that pace. On a normal writing schedule, when I don't have that craziness, uh, to deal with, um, 1,100 is about what I need to write to to write a novel every, you know, eight eight or eight or nine months is my is how often I turn them in. Hopefully, <clears throat> don't tell my editor. Um, and again, at the top there, it'll keep your uh, your total goal um, sort of marching up, and you can every day you can see it uptick a little bit. That's kind of cool. Um, it's nice to have little things like that just to help you know if you're on track, and then help you know, or just help you know keep you motivated to see that bar fill up. So. Um, project targets is very useful. So um, I just want to stop right there for a second and say that I think that's everything you would really need to know in order to do NaNoWriMo successfully. You may get to the end and have questions about how you actually compile. I can talk about that a little bit at the end if there's some extra time, but I see we're coming up on an hour already and people might have to, to take off and that's fine. Um, we can do another one in December maybe if you guys want to talk more about revising and compiling and all that. So real quick, I just want to talk about this POV thing that somebody noticed. So I'm going to actually hide this um, Star Wars one again and go back to the blank one that I created for you because I want to show you how it is by default and then how I changed it for that other uh, example we were looking at. So by default, over here you can see this general window um, and it says the word label here and it's calling what I've got selected a chapter. Uh, what I'm going to do real quick is click on Manuscript, and then I'm going to go click on the Outline button. Um, and just hang on a second. I've got something blocking my, my broadcast window. I can't see it. Just want to make sure you guys are seeing what I want you to. Um, so this is the Scrivener's actual outlining view. It's similar to the corkboard view. It's just a different way of looking at it. Um, 
And actually, you can see um, this label thing here. Let me make that a little bigger. Um, actually, all these are kind of handy to talk about. I'll try to do this quick. Um, so by default, Scrivener gives you some labels that you can give the stuff that's in your, um, in your binder, uh, one of them being chapter, another one being scene. Those are probably the two you would use most often, um, if you even care. It'll, name, it'll do those for you automatically, by the way. Um, but my problem with this is I, like, it does it, and that's great, but it's not super useful to me. I, I already know that this is a chapter because it's a folder, and I know what a scene is, and I've just never had a reason to need to use labels to track those down. They're, they're pretty obvious to me. Um, so in terms of actually um, uh, outlining my manuscript, um, it, this is going to vary from book to book. So what I suggest here could be completely useless to you, but there may be a different way to do it. So I'll try to give a few examples. Um, but in the case of that Star Wars one, uh, let me just go grab it again. Uh, actually, let me show you how you change these first. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go in, I'm going to try to remember where this is, um, metadata settings. So under project is this thing called metadata settings. And what I'm going to do, um, by the way, this is where you could put in things like the name of your book, an abbreviated title for some reason, I forget where that is useful, um, your author name, and some other stuff. Uh, those just get used when you, um, when you do that compile, and it had my name in there automatically. That's where it got that from. Uh, but what we're going to do is go to this Labels uh, tab. And these are the labels that Scrivener has uh, by default. Um, and so what I like to do is change these to be something that is important for whatever reason to the book I'm writing. In the example that I'm going to do with Star Wars, it's going to be what character's POV this chapter is from. And, um, and so in order to, um, to facilitate that, I'm going to rename all of these. So you notice I just changed that to POV there, the custom title. And uh, then I'm just going to rename all these by double clicking on them to various characters in my story. Uh, Luke, Han, and Kenobi, Vader, and uh, let's say Leia. You may not actually end up using all these. And you also don't have to do this at the beginning. This is actually more of a tool to help you keep organized later. But it can be useful when you're outlining because it can help you spot flaws in your outline. And I will show you what I mean by that in a second. Uh, so I've got my labels now set up for each character name. And you can add more if you want to. And maybe I've got a chapter from good old 3PO. Uh, or, or you can remove them if you want to. It's totally up to you. Um, but I'm just going to use those and say OK. And so now what I can do, and I'm going to jump over to my, my sample project again. So bear with me a sec. Uh, so I've got a new hope selected, and I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna click on the outline view. I try to, yeah, you can see that pretty good. So you can see here that I've got every character's uh, who's a point of view character marked for their chapter. Now, here's why this can be handy. Um, it can be handy later for just finding those, like, uh, but I want to talk right now about things like pacing and making sure you're getting the sort of right. Um, mix of things that you want for your book. Uh, so in this case, just go with me here for a second, that you're hypothetically writing a book that's from multiple characters' points of view, and you've decided for whatever reason, stylistically, that you want to make sure um, that all the characters are sort of equally represented or that one character is not dominating a certain portion of the book. And so you can see some problems here just by looking at this, that we've got um, four chapters here at the end that are all Luke. And uh, I'm just going to glance at this real quick. And I see that, um, uh, for example, Vader is not well represented. He's here at the beginning. He's got two chapters. And then he's never appearing again. And so what you can do then is you can, again, pretend this is, at the this is before November. You haven't started writing yet. This is just your outline. And what you're trying to decide here is whose point of view you're going to write these chapters from. You can, of course, change your mind later. Absolutely do that. This is just for you to kind of get a feel for it and start to plan it out. And you can tweak this as much as you want. Um, but what you may decide right now is that, OK, well, I need to fix this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the scene where the heroes flee the Death Star and Han's ship, instead of doing that from Luke's perspective, let's see what Vader was going through when they escaped. Maybe that'll be interesting. And then um, 
maybe again when the Death Star is destroyed, it would be kind of cool to see how Vader perceives the fact that he's just lost his Death Star. So now that's starting to look a little better. I see more blue here. Vader's kind of spread out through the book. I still got some problems with Luke having chapters back to back, but you know, you get the idea. You can go start to fix those things. And again, this becomes handy um, when you want to do things like only look at the book from Luke's perspective. The POV thing isn't the best example because I'm already naming my chapters that way. Um, except for a few of these in here, like Heroes Flee Tatooine. It might be better to say Luke Flees Tatooine for me. Um, so I lately I haven't been using my labels for the POV so much as things like, um, uh, let's say hypothetically that you've got a book that takes place uh, jumping back and forth between two time periods. And so you might want to go to project and say um, metadata settings, and instead of calling this POV, call it um, call it time frame or time, and then uh, you decide it's only two, so you're going to delete four of these and just go with um, the present and then your flashback chapters, which are in the past, like that. So now what you can do is you can go, okay, I want to make sure they alternate. So each chapter that I outline, I'm going to do present and past, present and past. And again, this is just a way for you to remember. Uh, when you're actually editing that you go decide to do, write Luke meets Kenobi chapter You can just glance over here. I hope you can see my cursor there. It's really small um, But I've got it set to the past. You can also change them here by the way um, There's some other stuff that you saw like status um, uh, This is more handy during revisions, so I wouldn't worry about it too much but this basically just lets you mark chapters as being done, or you've already gone through a revision pass, or it's a first draft, or maybe you haven't done anything with it yet. Um, these are fairly useful. I, I don't use them too often, to be honest. Um, but it can be happy when you're it can be handy when you're starting to revise a big project. You want to just go in and flag everything as first draft, and then you might be like me, where you're just jumping around like crazy to. Um, to tweak things. So I have one last thing that I want to get into, and I'm just going to quick check and see if there's any new questions. Um, got the POV colors. Um, Paula wanted some tips on uh, adding tools to menus. I can show you that in just a second. Um, and I think that's it for questions. So that's great. Um, hopefully that means I'm actually making sense. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, what is notes. So this is what I do. Um, let me get back to the top here. There we go. OK, so during NaNoWriMo, I mentioned before that minimizing distractions is a good thing. So there's two ways, uh, two tips I want to give you to do that. One is very simple, which is just to use Scrivener's full screen editing mode. And that is this button at the top. And once again, I cannot see my cursor. So. I will try to describe it. It's the black icon, um, which that little tip just popped up under, with the two arrows. And that basically, and I, I hope this does not break my broadcast here, but I'm going to go to full screen. Um, this lets you edit, and yours may not look exactly like this because I changed my colors, um, but this lets you edit in full screen. And by default, that might not completely hide what's behind Scrivener, <clears throat> but it gets a lot of your distractions out of the way. So what I actually do is I come down here to the bottom, and I say that I want my background fade to be complete. So I'm going to make my screen 100% black. This is how I write day in, day out. Um, and I've tweaked my color to be black. You can do that um, in the Scrivener uh, preferences. <clears throat> um, just go into preferences and look for full screen editor. You can tweak these colors like crazy. Um, and you can turn some other stuff on and off. You can also adjust your paper width. For some reason, I kind of like my um, my edit windows to be narrow, like a paperback width. Um, I just, I don't know, it's weird. I just like when it looks sort of like an actual book. But if for some reason you're trying to maximize your screen real estate, you could, um, you could widen this out um, to the full screen if you wanted. This isn't the best example because it's got some hard, hard page uh, or line feeds built into it. Um, and you can also make your font bigger. And again, this does not affect your output at all. So when you go to compile, It'll do the standard manuscript courier 11 point every time, or 12 point, whatever. 
Um, but if you've got your your eyes aren't that great, or maybe you'd like to see even more text, you can bump this way up um, and make it a lot easier for you to see. And actually, some people find in NaNoWriMo it's easier to um, write faster when you can't see a lot of what you've already written. And by using a large font, you can um, you can facilitate that. You could also go much smaller if you wanted to um, and uh, see a lot of stuff on the screen. I don't recommend that, but you know, basically. Like I said, it's November. This is the time to play around with different ways to do things. So try different stuff. So that's full screen mode. I'm going to hop out of that now because it's pretty self-explanatory. OK, so we're back in the main editor. So I want to talk about notes. So this is the other thing that I is sort of my personal, I don't know if innovation is the right word, but it's just how I use Scrivener. It works for me. Uh, and that is to, uh, when I'm writing, especially in the first draft, I may be jamming along. and um, I will realize maybe hypothetically, let's just say that something I wrote three days ago, um, if I had just said that it was, and I'm gonna give a dumb example here, but just said that it was a larger um, rebel ship when I first introduced that ship, um, that would help me for some reason in this scene. Like it would just be cooler if that ship was a lot bigger. This is a dumb example, but you get the idea. The thing with NaNoWriMo is you wanna resist the urge to edit at the moment that you have that kind of idea. Uh, and so I'm editing or I'm writing the scene fresh, but three chapters before this one, I first mentioned this small rebel ship and I want to make sure that I go back later and change it to a large rebel ship because that's what I'm going to do in my writing right now. And I want to make sure I don't miss that when I'm revising. And so what I do is I'll highlight the word smaller there and I will come up here to notes at the top, which is a little, looks like a little uh, yellow bubble, like yellow chat bubble. I'm going to click on that, and I've already, there's not going to be any notes in yours because it's a new project, but I've got a bunch of them in this one as, as examples. And I'm just going to write, um, go back and make this ship big. And so that's just my reminder. And now I can just, I go, okay, I captured that idea. I can worry about that later. And I'll just keep writing as if the ship was large. And I don't have to worry about stopping my momentum and going back and editing and finding every place where I talked about the size of that ship. That's too much to worry about right now. What I want to do is, is a year from now, when I'm editing this book, I will go through my notes one by one from the very top. And I will go, OK, oh, yeah, I should probably state specifically how far, far away this is in parsecs. These are just little, this is basically my to-do list. And the cool thing about these is clicking on them takes you to exactly the spot in the book where you had that thought. And what you can do is go, oh yeah, I want to I want to mention the power converters more. So I will I, when I'm revising, I will go back and do all my tweaks to this this comment here about power converters, adding it in earlier chapters and things like that. And then I'll come back here and I'll just get rid of it because I have now satisfied that item on my little to-do list here. And that's basically how I know when I've finished revisions is when I have no more little yellow um, to-dos over here. In terms of fixing like whatever thoughts I had, there's still other stuff to fix, like just you know improving the writing and all that. But these are the types of things that can really snag you during NaNoWriMo if you constantly are um, you know, realizing that that last scene, oh, I shouldn't have killed that guy because I need him in the scene, and dang it, now I gotta delete this chapter, da 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 Don't worry about it. You, the trick with NaNoWriMo is just to write and write and write and not worry about losing ground by going back and editing, revising, polishing, whatever. Save all that for December, but you don't want to forget those things. If you just think that, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have killed that guy, I'm going to keep writing as if I didn't kill him, but you don't leave a note for yourself, you're going to forget about it. And then later, uh, you know, it could be a while before you come back to this, you may completely uh, space on, why did I have this character in this chapter? And then he shows up later even though he's dead. <clears throat> and you won't remember why that happened. So that's why I do these um, these notes. And I find that really handy. Um, there's other ways to do it. Someone once asked me why I don't do it. Um, I got to these notes, by the way, by adding a note. But at the very bottom of this sidebar here, there's a bunch of different things. You don't really need to use any of these during November, I don't think. Um, keywords, maybe. But I don't want to talk about that right now. It's going to it's a time hole. Um, there's also these document notes that you may see. Don't confuse those with the comment or it's called a note, I think. Oh, no, it's called a comment. Good. It used to be called notes in Scrivener. Um, so I added a comment 
I'm sorry for using the word node a lot there. I hope I didn't confuse anyone. Because you also have this little yellow window down here called document notes. Um, this is just freeform text. I should make that one level shift there. Um, the problem with doing your to-do list at the document notes, or there's another thing called project notes, which is just for your entire Scrivener project. The problem with doing them there, you can do a little bulleted list here of the things that you want to fix. You could have 10 things here that you think are really important to, to do. The problem is they're not associated with anything in your actual project. So you can't, what, what rebel ship? Um, I could be seeing this note when I'm anywhere, and that just, it may be meaningless to you, and, it, and then you have to start hunting around and go, what was I talking about? I should have been more descriptive. Dang it. Um, well, if you do it here at notes, then when you've got your thing here about, uh, where did I put it? Make this ship big. Where was that? Oh, yeah, right there. So you jumped me right to the spot. So that's why I like to use notes in this way. I use project notes or document notes. Um, actually, <laughs> My main use for document notes is if I'm going to delete something, but I think it might be useful to say later, like maybe I describe somebody and I decide that I want to describe them earlier and I'm just going to, I might just use it as like a little parking lot. I will, I will, I will take some text that I'm going to move to a different part of the chapter. I'll cut it. I'll just hide it over here in document notes for a minute. And then I'll go find the spot where I think is right to put it in and I'll grab it back out. Um, the reason why I don't just rely on copy and paste is because while you're going through that, you may accidentally you know, decide to cut and paste something else and then you've lost that text that you cut. So kind of parking it over here is, is handy. Um, but I don't, I don't like document notes as to-dos because um, they're, just, uh, they're just hard to find later. So even if it's something that is a broad statement for this entire chapter um, and Luke finds message, I might, decide that I want to rewrite, rewrite this later <coughs> from a different character's point of view. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just highlight the first word, or sometimes I'll even just add a period, um, and I'll just highlight it and do add comment and uh, rewrite this chapter from that, or something like that. You get the idea. And so now, again, I can just move on, and I'll do my whole book. I'll get to the very end. Um, and then come December 1st, when I decide to start editing this, all I have to do is um, make sure I'm on the, the, the comments tab down here. And, um, and everything that I reminded myself to fix or improve or whatever, um, it's anything that pops into your head, really. I can just start banging them out. And I can go for the easiest ones first and then go for the ones that require rewriting a whole chapter later or however you want to approach it. Um, and for me personally now, as a, as a as a quote unquote pro writer. Um, when I do a first draft, I might have, you know, 200 of these things over here for the whole draft. And I will basically just go through and knock them all out until, like I said, I just delete them when I'm done. And once this window over here is empty, then I know it's ready to send to my editor. Um, and that's, that's basically how I do it. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think if there was anything else. Let me just check my notes here. I have, um, I talked about the cards and the outline view. Um, if anyone's still around and you want to see one more thing, I'm going to show you some cool things with um, the binder and what we call search. So remember that I, um, I did that in this one, didn't I? Past, present, past, present. I did. Okay. So, um, there's some other cool stuff you can do with um, Scrivener in terms of seeing only the things you want to see. I talked about earlier how you could kind of go around here and click on um, the loop chapters if you want to just edit those. Well, that's fine to just click on them, but you may not want to do that each time. So another thing you can do is I'll just do it once. I'll highlight them all, and then I'm going to go to um, Documents, and I'm going to come down here to Add to Collection new collection. And then you'll notice in my binder over here, I have a new area, and I'm going to call it Luke's Chapters. And so now I can actually use Scrivener uh, and all of its cool features, um, but I've suddenly reduced my view of this book to only Luke's chapters, and I can look at them one at a time. 
I can look at these three at once, I can work on these two, whatever I want to do. Um, again, you can see how this might be powerful because now you're basically, this is almost like the Luke novella all of a sudden. And if you're trying to make sure that Luke's character is consistent and that he's uh, going through a good emotional journey, whatever your goal is, being able to sort of quote unquote read your book as if it was just Luke, um, this is how you can do it. And then all you have to do is go back to Binder to get back to the whole thing again. And that didn't go away. It's still sitting up here. You can come back to it whenever you want. But um, you could make these for all kinds of things. And so you'll notice, by the way, there's one here called Search Results. You may not have this yet because you haven't done a search, but that's okay because we're going to do a search right now so you see what that is. So uh, what I'm going to do now is show you, um, here's another example. So, and forgive me for a second because I've got this already tweaked away from what the default is. So by default, when you search, um, I'm going to search for, I'm trying to think of a term that's used sort of sparingly throughout Star Wars. Let's say that I want to find everywhere that uh, the rebellion is mentioned. All right. Okay, so what I've got over here now is in my search results now, um, I've got uh, a, a handy set of all the scenes and chapters where someone mentions the rebellion. And so if you're trying to make sure that everywhere you did whatever, say you've got um, scenes in a certain place or they're going to a particular bar and you want to just, you, you need to go check that for some reason, make sure every time they enter that bar, you describe it correctly or something, uh, you can search for it and it'll find everything in your whole book where that word is mentioned. But sometimes you don't want to do that. Um, sometimes you want to do, uh, and actually I'm kind of regretting now that I um, changed my POVs to times, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> because what you could do, let's say we just quickly wanted to find all of the chapters that are set in the past without having to deal with um, uh, going to the outline view and clicking on them all or whatever. Um, what I can do here is I can, I'm going to click on this little drop down on the magnifying glass. Hopefully you can see that. It's that little tiny magnifying glass that's in the search window. And I'm going to say that I only want to search on my time label. Remember I, I renamed label to time. Um, it was POV before, but I changed it to time if you remember. So now I'm only going to search for words that appear in that label. And since I've only got two words in that label, this is going to be really easy. So I'm going to search for all the chapters that happened in the past. And boom, and some scenes there too. So you notice here, you can see that, that time thing right in the list. Um, there's every one of them. And so uh, that's just a quick way to grab that list and, and do some work on it. And you'll notice as I shift click them, because of the magic of edit scrivenings, it's going to show me uh, all of those in one aggregated view. And that's super powerful. Um, and if you use labels uh, intelligently for whatever's appropriate for your book, um, this can be super powerful for, um, for doing this. Uh, and, and maybe it doesn't matter for your book, and that's totally fine. Um, I've often thought that if I ever wrote a mystery, that I could use labels to maybe say um, what clue was unveiled where, and then you could quickly um, use this search to get those chapters. Or maybe you want to search more broadly within your entire project to find um, everywhere that the specific item that the clue is. It's the you know the uh, the Oscar statue that somebody got bludgeoned with. Um, you could search for it in the prose as well by just changing that search thing back to all. And again, this is one of those things in Scrivener that you may sort of mess yourself up with or, or get tripped up on, if you did change this for some reason to searching within some other thing like custom metadata that you've made or, or our time one, and then later you're just trying to find um, the mention of uh, robots. And so you come up here and you search for robots. It's not gonna find anything because I'm searching in my time thing only. So you just gotta remember to come back and set it to all or whatever it happens to be that you want to search in, and then you'll find everywhere that robots get mentioned. Um, so again, it's, it's one of those things where you don't want to panic because if you do this, it might look like, oh my God, Scrivener ate every scene I had with the word robots. How did that happen? Um, don't panic. It's still there, and you don't have to worry. Um, so uh, Paula, if you're here, uh, I will tell you now about adding tools to the toolbar 
which is the only menu customization I know of in Scrivener, and I hope that answers your question. But uh, basically what you can do is, um, let me find it. I'm going to go to project, I think. Uh, no. Customize toolbar. It's under view, way down here at the bottom. Customize toolbar. So basically Scrivener is now going to show me every possible thing that you can put on the toolbar, and you literally can just drag them up there. Uh, and so if you've got something that you're just using a lot in Scrivener for whatever reason, um, I don't know what that might be, but let's say you are using the very handy feature that lets you sync your Scrivener project to um, some other writing tool that you like to use, which is something Scrivener can do. Uh, you could just drag that up there on the toolbar, and then it's done. And now you've got a handy sync button. Whenever you want it, you can just click on it without having to go hunt through menus. I don't know if that's exactly what you were asking, Paula, but um, that's the only uh, customization to Scrivener's interface that I'm aware of. You can do other things like hiding these side windows and stuff or the very handy full screen mode. Um, but um, uh, And you can you know resize things all you want. There is one other thing, maybe I'll show you real quick, um, Paula, that is useful. And this is probably useful to everybody. Uh, and that is split screen. So uh, one other thing you might do, uh, you might be writing um, and you've just described a character. Um, I just, just hypothetically say that um, you're, you're editing down here and uh, you've got Ben Kenobi talking and you can't remember what color you said his robe was. Well, again, you've got this problem in Word where if you started to scroll around and look for the first time you mentioned Ben and see what color you said his robe was, it can be hard to find where you were writing that you needed to know that. Uh, and Word can do this too, but I just want to show it to you. There's this little icon. Um, again, my cursor seems to be gone, but it's this little double pane thing in the very top right of the editing window. I'll click on it a few times so you can see where I'm clicking, hopefully. But that basically splits your screen in two. And so then what you can do is, is you can keep the one where you were writing, uh, but you can go up to this other one and start to bounce around your project and look for where you first mentioned Ben, or you can search for Ben, or whatever it is. And then once you've found, oh yeah, he had a brown robe, um, then you can come back down here and um, click on the button to make it the full screen uh, option again. So that's really handy when you're editing. Or if you've done a lot of research and you've parked you know, tons of pictures or um, schematics or whatever you like to do in your research folder down here, um, that can be handy for when you're writing and you want to remember what that planet looked like or just use it as kind of a you know inspiration type thing. Um, you could split your screen and put your research stuff on the top and your writing area on the bottom. It's just a handy way to remember what something looked like or whatever it happens to be. Um, I hope that makes sense. Okay, it looks like there is a new uh, question that just showed up. So, oh, no, it's Paula saying thanks. You are quite welcome. Uh, let me see if there's anything else in here. I don't think so. Um, so what I want to do then is just open this up to you guys. Um, again, use the Q&A thing to ask questions. Um, I will quickly pop over to the YouTube page in case anybody's following along there and see if there's any YouTube comments. And I'll also look on the Google Plus page to see if there's any new comments real quick. Um, so I'll give you guys a few minutes to think of any questions you might have. Um, and if not, then we can wrap up. Um, and again, like I said, you may have questions after you've actually used this for a month and you're in November or December, excuse me, and uh, something wasn't working for you or you weren't sure if you were using it right, I'm more than happy to uh, do another one of these. And we can even make it more interactive where uh, if somebody just wants to show me their project and share their screen and ask me questions. Um, we can set it up like that so that I can basically invite people in to the uh, control part of this and let them share their project and talk about it and ask questions. So, okay. Take a few minutes, I'm gonna grab a drink of water and look at the comments, like I said, and I'll come right back and answer any other questions anybody has. Otherwise, uh, you guys are more than welcome to take off, uh, and thanks for watching. I'm muting my mic.
Uh, okay, I'm back, and I don't see any new questions in the window, so um, I guess that means we are done. Um, if you do think of anything later, or you go back and watch this on YouTube, and something piques your attention and you want to ask me about it, um, you are more than welcome to email me. Um, I'm not super savvy with Google Hangouts, but let me just uh, put it up on the screen here. My email address, um, go ahead and drop me a note if you've got any questions at all, um, and I will be happy to answer them for you. Um, other than that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off then. Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, good luck with NaNoWriMo. I hope you do awesome. All right.